Hopefully everyone has a church bulletin. If you don't, raise your hand. We'll get you a bulletin. There's an outline of uh, today's sermon inside the, the bulletin, and you can fill in the blanks as we, we go along. And just a reminder, uh, in case you came in late, after the service, Scott and I want to meet anyone up here who can sing or can play a musical instrument, because uh, we're looking at uh, starting two services sometime next year, so we want to see what talent that we have within the, the church of someone who might be interested in helping us lead music in the, in the second service. So if you can sing, and from what I've been hearing, we've got a lot of singers out here this morning. You sounded pretty good here this morning. So I, uh, I love this time of year. Uh, my wife and I, in case you don't know, we, we moved from Connecticut. Uh, I wasn't born in Texas. My wife was uh, from Texas, but I wasn't born in Texas, but I tell people I was born again in Texas. Okay? And that, that, that matters more than being born in Texas, being born again in Texas. So this is where I found Jesus Christ, in, in Texas. And I was in the Army at the time, Fort Hood, Texas, uh, and First Baptist Church at Copper's Cove. Um, I walked into a Baptist church, and I thought, you know, I think I could find God here, and I did. So I'll make a long story short. We went to Connecticut for, for 10 years, got to minister to my, my family until my parents both passed away, and now the Lord has moved us back here. But uh, while we were in Connecticut, we lived in a little town called Ellington, and had a nickname called Smellington, and that was because uh, the, the manure that they would just spread in the field, it was just a, a farming community, and after a while, it just smelled like home. You know, we lived there for a long, just... <laughs> Just, just got used to it, you know. But I was always amazed at this time of year uh, because all year we would be watching the corn grow. And on, on the, we'd be driving to, to work and we'd be driving past all these cornfields. And it's just amazing to watch it grow. And this time of year it's called harvest time. And they would be out there with machines and it would just be amazing to watch them uh, seeing, laying those fields bare with those, those machines. And uh, like in one day they could just take down a whole field. It was, uh, it was amazing. You know? But I, I have to think, I'm, I'm sure come harvest season, the farmer doesn't think to himself, I wonder what I'm going to harvest this year. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't go out to his field and say, well, will you look at that, it's corn. Well, well, who, who to thunk it? You know, it, it, it's, it's corn. Yeah. Well, why, why is that? Because there's a law in the universe that, that states that whatever a person sows is what that person reaps. It's called the law of, of the harvest. If you plant corn, you're going to get corn. If you plant watermelon, you can expect watermelon. The, the type of seed you sow will determine the type of harvest that, that you reap. And that's the natural law of the harvest that God has set in place that whatever you plant, that's what you reap. Well, that's good for farmers, pastor. What has that got to do with today's sermon? Well, if you would, let's turn to Galatians chapter 6, page 150 in your pew Bible. Galatians chapter 6, page 150 in your pew Bible. Are you there? Galatians chapter 6, yeah, page 150 in your pew Bible. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in the due time... We will reap if we do not grow weary. Would you pray with me? Uh, Heavenly Father, we just, we want you this morning, Father. We don't want to have our ears tickled. We don't want to hear a bunch of platitudes. We want to hear the truth of your word, what your word has to say to us. And I pray that you will speak to each and every one of us here today, that you'll speak to our hearts, that you'll touch our hearts, that you'll draw us near to you, that you'll uh, maybe convict us of anything we need to be convicted of or, or minister to us where we need to be ministered or just love on us. As we seek to draw near to you, your word says you will draw near to us. 
Father, I pray that as we, as we unfold the scripture this morning, that I can get out of the way and that people will not see me, but they will see you as revealed through the scripture. May you speak to us through your word here today, Father Lord. May you use me as, as your instrument. May you open up our minds and our hearts to the truth of your word. May we not just hear your word and so deceive ourselves, but may we do what it says. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. So if you have your outline, there are six truths I want us to look at today about the law of the harvest. Number one, it's a, anyone want to guess? It's a spiritual law, right? The law of the harvest is not only a physical law, the law of the harvest also applies to the spiritual realm as well. Corn and watermelon deal with the physical, uh, I mean the natural and the physical realm. But the same creator who made the natural realm also created the, natu- uh, the spiritual realm and, and the spiritual laws. And he put the same law of the harvest in effect that is in the natural realm into the spiritual realm. So what you sow spiritually is what you are going to reap spiritually. Galatians 6, 8 says, The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You see, in the, in the spiritual realm, there are two kind of seeds that we can plant. There are seeds to the flesh and to, to, to evil and sin, and there are spiritual seeds to the Spirit that are pleasing to God. And what are some of the seeds to the, uh, the sinful nature? Uh, if you look just uh, uh, back a little bit, Galatians 5, 16. Galatians 5, 16. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to picture your life that has two fields. And every day that you wake up, you're sowing seeds either to the spiritual field or you're sowing seeds to the physical field, the seeds of, of the flesh. There's no third field that you, that you sow seeds to. There's only two seeds that we can sow uh, um, in the, in the fields. And some of the seeds that he talks about, he says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right away, I, I know you're probably thinking, well, I practice some of these things. Well, that must mean I'm not saved. Now, when he talks about practicing these things, he's talking about, is this your lifestyle of practice? Not those who stumble and fall into sin. Is this your every, does this describe your everyday life? Because actually what he's describing here is an unbeliever. Because a believer possibly can't continue on like this. Cannot live a, a, a life that practices these things. So every day, the, the, the tiniest decision will lead us to sow a seed in a good field or a bad field. In the spiritual field or the, the, the physical, flesh, fallen, sinful world. If we sow the seed to the spiritual nature... We're going to reap the harvest. If we, if we sow a seed to the physical nature, we're going to reap the harvest. Now, what is it that we reap from the sinful nature? Galatians 6.8, it says we, we reap destruction and corruption. The Greek word for destruction is pithora, which means decay, and it gives the idea of a, of a rotting corpse. Uh, I was, uh, had a strange odor coming from my office. So I climbed up in the, the attic, and I looked in the attic, and lo and behold, on the, the air conditioning vent is a dead rat. And this thing's huge, and it's, it's stinking. It, it's just stinking. That's, you know, that's what rotting corpses do. They stink, right? And that's, that's what he's talking about. The Bible tells us in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 15, it says that we're to give off the aroma 
of Christ. Right? That's the aroma. The, the aroma of, of life. But to those without Christ, we're the aroma of, of, of death. Right? What aroma are you giving off to people? Hopefully we're giving off the aroma of life, of, uh, of Christ. Unfortunately, there's a lot of decay going on in, in our world today, the aroma of death. Magic Johnson is, is a good example. Uh, he was one of the greatest basketball players who ever lived. And he had to retire early because he contracted the HIV virus. And he was quoted as saying in the New York Post, I lived a bachelor's life and now I'm paying for it. I was wrong for sleeping with a lot of women. I'm paying the price for it now. I'm in the battle for my life. Can you smell the decay? No one is exempt from the law of the harvest. Pete Rose only wanted to get into the Baseball Hall of Fame, but now he's suffering the consequences for, for betting. Can you smell the decay? We had another one, Sam Hurd, recently, he, who was a former Bears and Cowboys receiver who uh, uh, just has been sent to prison for 15 years after such a promising career in, in football. Can you smell the decay taking place? Ted Haggard, who started a church in Colorado, over 10,000 members, fell into sin and temptation and had adulterous affairs and, and did drugs. Uh, do you smell the decay? What about a man who is in a, a, in a, he's bored in, in his marriage and he goes to work and his secretary understands him? Right? His, his, his co workers is tender and, and caring. Can you smell the decay? taking place in, in, in our lives. You know, I could go on and on with the works of the flesh that lead to destruction and decay. If we plant the seed to the sinful nature, we're going to reap destruction of the sinful nature. But you know what? It may not happen right away. And that's where some of us are led astray. Right? We, we think, I haven't, I haven't reaped any consequences of this yet. So God, God probably doesn't care. And you know what? God is probably... He knows me, and he's making an exception, right? From the time you plant the seed until the time you have a harvest, is there not a lot of time? It doesn't happen instantaneously. You see, the seeds to the flesh that you're planting now, just because you don't immediately uh, uh, see any consequences to it, does not mean there won't be any consequences. God is giving you time to repent. He is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. You're on his timetable. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. You know, some Christians, they sow to the flesh, they sow to the flesh, they sow to the flesh, and then they wonder, why is my marriage falling apart? Why is my family going astray? Why are my finances so bad? And then they blame God. You know, you, you can't sow seeds to the flesh Monday through Saturday, and then come to Sunday, Sunday, you come to church and you're praying for a crop failure. It, 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 it doesn't work that way, right? <laughs> it is the truth, isn't it? It is the truth. On a more positive note, God's word says, Galatians 6, 8, the one who sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. That's the law of, of the harvest. Depending on what seed we sow will determine a blessing or a curse. God's word says if we sow good seed, we'll reap the harvest of eternal life. Uh, how many of you like eternal life? Do we like eternal life? You're going to spend eternal life somewhere. The question is where? Right? And understand something also, that when you die... Eternal life does not begin for you. As a Christian, you understand that your eternal life has already begun? You're all, as a Christian, you're already plugged into eternity. When you die, you just change locations. That's it. But you're already plugged into eternity. And God wants you to experience eternal life right now. He wants you to experience eternity with him now. He wants you to experience a close relationship and fellowship. How will it be in heaven when we're, when we're worshiping and praising God? Do you think it'll be awesome? Right? I think it'll be, oh, wow. You know, I think it'll be, wow. You know, I, what will the choir be like in heaven? Right? 
you know, that, I, I talked to Scott about that also. I'd like our choir to be multi. I want kids up here. I want youth up here. I want older people up here. Because that's how the choir is going to be in heaven. Amen. Right? All different races. You know, if you, if you don't like worship here, you're definitely not, not going to like it in heaven. This is the rehearsal for the real thing. But your eternal worship of God has already begun. Your eternal life has already begun. God wants you to experience it now. Galatians 5.22 gives us the harvest of eternal life that we can experience now. Look at Galatians 5.22 through 25. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory, the victory. All right. <laughs> Galatians 5. Look at Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. How many of you want this? Do you want this in your life? That's the fruit of the Spirit, but you got to reap to, to, to the, re, start receiving the fruit of the Spirit. You can't continually sow seeds to the flesh and want to reap the fruit of the Spirit. You know, why do people do drugs? They want peace. They want joy. They want to be happy. God will give you that, but you got to get it his way, not your way. Satan will offer it to you. Hey, here's a shortcut. You don't have to do God's way. Just pop this pill or drink this drink. But in, in the end, it leaves you uh, wanting so much more. After a while, you know what? One pill just can't satisfy. Now you need two. One drink won't satisfy. Now you need three or four. Satan, that's how he is. It, always wanting more. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Right? Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. I like some translation. Who has, let's keep in step with the Spirit. I, I like that translation. I'm, I'm an army guy, and I can relate that. How many army we got here? Air, Air Force marches too, don't they? Right? I think so. But... But, but when you, when, no, they don't mind. <laughs> but when you, when you keep in step, right? Yeah. Keep in step. Yeah. Think about that. Keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Phil, can you be the Holy Spirit for a minute? <laughs> you can try? All right. <laughs> I just, now, now, what's important with, with me and Phil is that we're in step. Ready? Forward. Hooch. One, two, three, four. Right? We're in step. Now, now, what happens if I get out of step? Right? I throw us out. I've got to get back in step. Now, what happens with Phil? He's up there. What about me? Where, I, I'm back here. Now, I can't get ahead of Phil either. Right? I've got to be with Phil. I got, thank you, Phil. I've got to be in step with the Holy Spirit. So, you know what? I don't care what you did yesterday. I don't care what you did yesterday. I want to know right now, right now, are you in step with the Holy Spirit? It's not a one-time thing. It's a continual thing. Continual thing. Oh, well, I used to teach Sunday school for... That's nice. What have you done lately? Are you in step with the Holy Spirit? Are you doing what he wants you to do this very moment of your life? Are you in step with the Holy Spirit? If you're sowing seeds to the, the, the spiritual nature, I can assure you, you probably are. But if you're continually sowing seeds to the flesh, you've gotten out of step somewhere. Or you've gotten ahead of the Holy Spirit. Or you've gotten behind the Holy Spirit. But right now, are you where God wants you to be? Are you walking in step with the Holy Spirit? So how do we sow seeds to the flesh? That's easy. Just do whatever you want, right? What was the motto of the 60s, if you can remember it? Do your own thing, right? If it feels good, do it. That was the motto of the 60s, right? Do your own thing. It's easy to sow seeds to the flesh. 
Just do it. If it feels good, do it. Just go with the flow. Even dead bodies can float downstream, right? So how do you sow seeds to the Spirit? That's a really good question. Number one, you need to deny yourself. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. It's hard to deny yourself in this world. Oh my goodness, we have so many pleasures. It's hard. Every day you have to deny the flesh. Every day. Now, I'm, uh, uh, how, how many men have a problem with lusting after women? You know, they, they did a survey. They, they did a survey one time, and I admit, I do. I'm, I, I have a problem with that. They did a survey at a men's conference one time, and 90% of the men said they had a problem with lusting after women. And they found out the other 10% had a problem with lying. Okay? All right? I mean, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard, but you know what? Every day you have to deny yourself. Every day. Every day you have to make a choice. Do I want to sow seeds to the flesh? Or do I want to sow seeds to the spiritual nature? It's not easy, is it? But you have to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and, and follow Jesus. You have to fill your mind and heart with, with the word of God. You have to pray. You have to go to church. You have to seek to be full of the, the Holy Spirit. Do I really need to go to church? Yes. Yes. Can I just be spiritual at home? Not according to God's plan. You can be spiritual at home. You can be spiritual on a mountaintop. But God's word also says, don't give up the habit of meeting together. You know, the, I don't care if it's in a home with other Christians. That could be church. But you, Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for the church. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Read that. Jesus shed his blood. You don't have to read it right now. Write it down. Jesus, if Jesus shed his blood for the church, how important is the church of Jesus Christ? Very, very important. Jesus Christ established a church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We're the body. He has gifted each and every believer to serve within the body of Christ. So we can't say going to church is not important. I gave the example of being a football player. I can't say I'm a football player if I'm not part of a team. And a Christian needs to be part of a family, needs to be part of a, uh, part of a church. Uh, listen to Christian music. Don't fill your mind with, with uh, that worldly, secular music. Uh, the message isn't very godly, is it? Fellowship with Christians. In February, we're starting small groups. Um, we hope you can be a part of that. And that's a time for you to get to know other Christians. Fellowship with Christians. Get to know each other. Past the Sunday morning, hi, how are you? Everything's fine. We can really get to know each other and pray for each other and encourage each other. So I, I, I'm plugging into small groups right now. You need to get plugged into a small group. And then minister in, in the name of Jesus. Give a cup of water in, in the name of Jesus. And then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28 through 30, Jesus tells us if your eye causes you to sin, do what? Pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, what? Pluck it off or cut it off. What was Jesus talking about? Does he want a bunch of one-eyed, one-handed people here? What was he talking about? He, he was talking about us taking drastic measures to get those things out of our lives that are continually causing us to fall into sin and temptation. Get rid of them. If I'm going to diet, and if I want to eat healthy, I can't hang around McDonald's all day. And if the computer's a problem for me, then you need to get a filter. I put a filter on my computer because it's just too easy to a couple of clicks and you can look at pornography. It's too easy. You need to get a filter on your computer. Don't play around with sin. Because you may not reap the harvest yet, but you're going to. Amen. And there's destruction, there's death that Satan wants to bring your way. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your spirituality. He wants to destroy your relationship with God. He wants to destroy your witness. He wants you to keep so wrapped up and bound in sin that he's rendered you totally ineffective for anything worthwhile for the kingdom of God. 
don't play around with sin. Satan never keeps a promise either, does he? Right? He never keeps a, a, a promise. Let's look at number two. The law of the harvest is unavoidable. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. The Greek word for mocked here is mukterizo. And it basically means to thumb up, thumb your nose at God. Uh, to sneer, ridicule, to show contempt. Uh, you, you, you thumb your nose up at God when you ignore his command, when you push him away, when you live your life the way you want to, and then you think you can get away with it. But God's word says, don't, don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. You can't thumb your nose up at God and, and, and get away with it. You can't sow to the flesh, continually sow to the flesh, and think you're, you're, you're going to be all right. Now suppose you went up on the top of this roof here, and you jumped off because you did not think the law of gravity applied to you. What would happen to you? You would go splat. Okay? You cannot ignore the law of gravity and think it doesn't apply to you any more than you can ignore God's spiritual laws and think that they don't apply to you. They apply to you. Don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. We reap what we sow, right? Silence does not mean God's divine approval. Just because you haven't reaped any consequences yet. He's given you time. You're on God's timetable for sowing and, and reaping. It may be sooner, it may be later, but it will happen. You will reap what, what you sow. And you're deceived into thinking if you can thumb your nose up at God and get away with it. Nobody is exempt. I'm not exempt. You're not exempt. I don't care how much work you do for the Lord. You're, you're not exempt. God gave Adam and Eve one simple law. One simple law. That's all they had to do. What was that law? Don't eat from that. You can eat from any other tree in the garden, but please don't eat from that one tree. That's all. Then Satan comes along. And rather, well, this, Satan got them thinking about not all the trees that they could eat from, but the one tree that God put off limits. The knowledge of good and evil, right? See, it's not just like, a, rather than thinking of all the blessings we got, Satan wants us to remind us of what we don't have. But you don't have this. Oh, if you had this, then you'd be happy. They had all the other trees in the garden to make them happy. But Satan tempted them to disobey God. And what did Satan say? God said, if you eat from this, you will die. Satan said, you will not die. They ate from it and they died. You see, Satan is a deceiver. He never keeps a promise. He's a liar. And God says, if you sow to the sinful nature, you're going to reap the consequences. And Satan is saying to you, no, you won't. No, you won't. Just as he deceived Adam and Eve. No, you won't. It's okay. God's going to look. To, he's going to wink at you. He's going to say, it's all right. It's all right. No, you won't. You reap what you sow. Satan has deceived many people to think that they can live however they want and God's laws don't apply to them. Let's look at number three. The law of the harvest is far-reaching. The law of the harvest is far-reaching. In other words, the seeds I sow right now may or may not come into fruition in my life, but you know what? They may start appearing in my children. And they may start appearing in their children and their children. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, page 55 in your pew Bible. Exodus 20, verse 5, page 55 in your pew Bible. Let, let me proceed this by, by setting this up with something, okay? Deuter uh, and, and you can write this down, and just for the sake of time, uh, I don't, uh, 
just write these, these verses down. Deuteronomy 24, 16 and Jeremiah 31, 30. Deuteronomy 24, 16 and Jeremiah 31, 30. Because these are two passages that, I, that you need to read and understand where it says, you know what? Each and every one of us is responsible for our own sin. Okay, you're going to die for your own sin. You're responsible for your own sin. I'm not responsible for my father's sin, and my father is not responsible for my sin. You need to understand that before we read this, this passage. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity or the sin of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generation. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. Didn't you just tell me that we're each responsible for our sin? What this passage is telling us is this. That the sins of the parents often reappear in their children. My father drank, smoked, and cussed. Guess what I grew up doing? Yeah. You see? The sins of the father, they're, they're passed down to, to, to the children. That doesn't mean that... that uh, 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 my father's sins are passed down to me. I'm responsible for my own sins. But he had a great influence on, on the way that I, I, I live my, my life. The sins of the parents reappear in their children. My brother is an atheist. And I feel bad for his children because I don't believe they really had a chance to, to choose for themselves uh, about thumbing their nose at God. My brother thumbs his nose at God, so his children thumb their nose at God. And also, if you look in the Bible, that in Genesis chapter 12, uh, again, for the sake of time, we're not going to read that, but Abraham told a lie, and he told his wife, uh, say that you're my sister, right? Remember that when he was going down in Egypt? Say that you're my sister. Well, in Genesis chapter 26, verse 6, we read that his son Isaac told the same thing to his wife. So you see how the sinful nature, the, the sins are passed down to, to the Father. We're each responsible for our own sins. Um, understand something. If you don't hear anything else, hear this then, okay? I want you to imagine a, 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 a smooth pond, okay? And you take a rock and you throw it into the center of the pond. And what do you have? A bunch of ripples. Understand something. Every time you sin, you don't sin in a vacuum. There is a ripple effect to your sin. It will affect your marriage. It will affect your family. It will affect your children. You don't sin in a vacuum. Is the price worth it? Surely you will not die. Surely you will not have any effects to this sin. I haven't seen anything yet, but you will. There's a ripple effect to our sin. If you keep sowing to the sinful nature, you're going to reap the consequences of the sinful nature. Don't be deceived. Let's look at number four. The law of the harvest is an encouraging law. Is an encouraging law. Are you still in Exodus chapter 20? Look at verse 6. Now first he said, uh, uh, he, it, a father who sins that uh, the iniquity is going to be passed down to what? The third and fourth generation, right? But what does he say in 6? But I'm showing love and kindness to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. Do you notice that the harvest of the spiritual seed is much more far-reaching than the sinful seed? Right? Much more far, far-reaching. When we sow in the Spirit, understand something. We're, we, we, can reap, we can not only reap a good harvest, but our children will and their children. And you know what? The harvest is much more far-reaching than, than the sinful harvest. Right? It's to a thousand uh, uh, generations. In my family, we started a new family tree. I'm the only Christian in my family. And my boys now have children, and their children are going to church. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing. We started something new. And I may be dead a thousand years, but you know what? Their kids and their kids and their kids and their kids Hallelujah. will be impacted Amen. by me. Yes. By me. Because I said, as for me and my host, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. And that has an impact for generations to come. I sowed seed to the good spiritual nature, right? And you'll reap the fruit of it. And you may not even see it, but your children will, and their children will, and their children will. Our, our sowing the seeds has long-lasting effect. And you know what? Start sowing them now. 
Start sowing them now. Number five, it's a law full of grace. At this point in the sermon, you're probably feeling pretty heavy and and discouraged because you're thinking, man, what have I done? I've blown it. I've been sowing a lot of sinful seeds. Uh, uh, Understand something. We've all have. We've all been sowing sinful seeds. We all haven't. You know, the, the biggest thing is we need to recognize it, confess it, and eliminate it. This is one passage I don't want to brush over. Could you turn to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, page 185 in your pew Bible? First John chapter 1, verse 9. I'm picking on the youth back there. I love youth because they, they can memorize songs like that. It, it's amazing the, 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 the songs that, that, that they can memorize, right? Uh, we have the capacity to memorize, don't we? Because sometimes we think, uh, uh, I can't memorize Scripture. Yes, you can. You can memorize Scripture. And I think it's important that you memorize Scripture. Um, now, the, the best analogy I can think of is Barney Fife. Okay? Uh, Barney Fife, where did he keep his bullet? In his pocket. And when he encountered a crisis, what did he have to do? Man, he's trying to fumble. He's trying to put that bullet in there, and he drops the bullet. And he, he wasn't prepared, was he? His gun wasn't loaded. You know, uh, we can't keep our Bibles in our pocket. We can't keep them on our nightstand. They're saying the biggest dust bowl in history would happen if all Christians open up their Bible at the same time. We have to read the Bible. We have to load our guns now. And not when a crisis hits. Memorize Scripture. And here's a good one to start with. I want you to memorize 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Memorize it. Put it in your gun. If that's the one bullet you got in your gun to shoot at Satan when he tempts you, then you use this bullet every time. Use this bullet every time. Okay? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, understand that that word there means to agree with God. We're not informing God of our sin. God is not sitting up there in heaven saying, You did what? He knows that you've sinned. He wants to know, do you know that you've sinned? So the confess means to agree with God. Do you agree with God that you've sinned? Do you admit? In other words, you're taking God's viewpoint of your sin. No longer are you taking your viewpoint. You're looking at yourself from God's point of view, and you're saying, God, I blew it. This guy blew it. I'm, I'm with you, Lord. I did wrong. I confess. I sinned. If we confess our sins, God will do something. He will say, you idiot, you fool, and he'll kick you out of the kingdom for good. Is that what it says? He will condemn you for life. He will cast you into the fiery pit of hell. No, what will he do? Isn't that good news? You see, Jesus Christ did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. There is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. You understand that? God's word says, if you confess... I'll do something. I'll forgive you. Wow. Do you hear that, people? Do you hear that? You, I want you to think about all those seeds that you planted in the wrong field. Think about all those seeds. And if you ask God to forgive you, you know what God's going to do? He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll purify you from all unrighteousness. And then he'll, he'll go plow up your field. He'll get rid of all those, 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 those seeds that you have planted. And you know what? He'll put a new song in your heart. And he'll start planting some new seeds in your life. And you'll begin to experience new joy and peace and hope in, in your life. He's the Lord of the harvest. Right? Let him start planting some good seeds in your heart and in your life. But it has to begin with you. If I confess my sins... God is faithful and just and will forgive me 
and purify me from all unrighteousness, and you can take that to the bank. And if you don't have any other bullet in your gun, you keep that bullet in your gun. And you realize, I don't care what you have done in the past. Let me ask you this. Has, don't, don't, please don't raise your hand. Any murderers here? Has anybody ever killed anybody? Don't raise your hand, I said. Okay. Paul called himself a chief sinner. I am a chief sinner, Paul said. Paul killed people. He violently attacked the Christians. Do you understand that? When the stoning of Stephen happened, do you know who was close by and who approved of it? Paul. He was a persecutor of the church. And he said, of all the sinners, he said, I'm a chief one. Keep that in mind when you read Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, page 155 in your pew Bible. Philippians 3, 13. Page 155 in your pew Bible. Are you with me? Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. What is it? The Christian life. Perfection. But one thing I do, forget what lies behind me. And reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what is Paul saying? Paul said, man, I'm a bad dude. I've sown a lot of bad seed in my life. I've killed people. I've had people killed. I've persecuted uh, uh, Christians. But one thing I do, I got to forget what's behind me because that's forgiven. That's forgiven. I've asked God to forgive me. And now I press on towards what is ahead. Satan does not like that, people. He wants you living back there in sorrow, regret, guilt, and shame. But Jesus nailed your, your sin, your guilt, and your shame to the cross. Jesus said, if I have set you free, you are free indeed. If you confess your sins, I forgive you. One thing you need to do is forget what's behind you and strain towards what is ahead. And experience the life that God has come to give you. Don't live your life full of regret. Don't live your life full of regret. I don't care how old you are. Joel 2.25, one of my favorite passages. You can look it up later. You got a lot of work to do, don't you? I'm going to read to you what it says. If you want to look there, it's on page 649, if you really want to read with me. Let's say you're like me. I was 34 years old when I became a Christian. I wasted a lot of years of my life. But then I surrendered my, year, my life to the Lord. And the Lord's using me now. To my astonishment and amazement. Every day, right? I, I, I'm amazed at how he uses me. And he, he's not using me because, you know, he didn't pick Jeff because Jeff is, man, that guy, he's such a good, good speaker. I'm not. He knows that. Oh, that Jeff, he's such a stand-up moral character. I'm not. He knows that. Oh, that Jeff, he's so good looking. Well, we can take something. Okay. But but he he's also humble. Okay? He's also very humble. But 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 God chooses the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He picks people like me and he, he he cleans us up and then he holds us up and then he says, Look what I can do. To someone who is fully committed and surrendered to me. If I could use this guy, <laughs> what can I do with you? Right? All he's looking for is someone to surrender uh, uh, your, your life to, to him. Joel 2.25, one of my favorite passages. And he did it in my life. He'll do it in yours. The Lord says, then I will make up for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. Now, when locusts come through, they totally devastate. 
Have you had some devastation in your life? Have the locusts been coming through your life? If you look back in your life, is it a big wilderness where the locusts have just come through and just laid waste? Huh? Yeah. That's how Satan works. But God says, you know what? I can make up for those wasted years. I can make up for that wasted time. So I don't care if you're nine years old or 90 years old. If you will submit your life to God and say, here I am, Lord. I want to start sowing some seeds to the spiritual nature. I want to be used by you for your kingdom in a mighty way. Here I am, Lord. Watch what he'll do. Watch what he'll do. I've never regret a person who said, man, I re- regret the day I became a Christian. Have you? Have you ever met anyone who said that? No. I've met a lot of people like me who says, man, I regret all the time I've wasted before I became a Christian. But don't let that regret and those wasteful years hold you back either. One thing I do, I forget what's behind me, and you strain towards what is ahead. Amen? Amen. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to help you. Ask God to restore you. Ask God to rip up those ungodly seeds and plant a new harvest in your life. And don't you think he will? Don't you think he will? We're going to have a time of uh, invitation. Oh, the last law. We'll go through that real quick. It's, It's a law that requires patience. Patience. It says, let us not lose heart in doing good, for at the proper time you're going to reap the harvest. Uh, you know what? What's the saying? It, sometimes it gets darkest before the dawn. Satan will want you to give up right before the harvest is getting ready to take place. He'll be whispering in your ear, you know what? Quit praying. Quit seeking God. Quit trying to live the life. that it, It's no use. It's not going to do any good. He's a deceiver. Don't listen to him. He's a liar. God's word says, don't give up. Don't give up, because at the proper time, you will reap the harvest. I'm not a big poem guy, but I found a poem I want to read to you, okay? And then I'll close. And it, the title of it is called the Cedar Christian, C-E-D-A-R, like the tree, cedar, okay? Jesus, help me to be for thee just like a big, strong cedar tree. When all of the other trees are bare, the cedar stands so green and fair. The wind and the storm, the ice and the cold make it more beautiful to unfold. So I would stand in trial and test, just trusting you to do what's best. Though others fail, Lord, keep thou me. May I a cedar Christian be. Let's pray. Father, Lord, help us to stand firm in our faith. Help us to experience the life that you have come to give us. Father, Lord, I know that uh, some are here today, Father, Lord, that that, uh, they have been failing over and over again to live the Christian life you've called them to live. And perhaps it's because they've been trying to live it in their strength and their power, and they haven't totally surrendered their lives to you. Uh, Father, your word says that if we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, then you will hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and bring healing to our land. Father, let it begin in our lives. Let it begin in this church. Father, let the, let the harvest, the new harvest, begin in our lives. Let us experience the eternal life, the abundant life that you have come to give us. Uh, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants us to plant uh, uh, seeds to the sinful nature in our lives. Father, we ask you right now to rip up that harvest, that sinful harvest. We ask that you would just take away all those sinful seeds that we have planted. We ask that you would forgive our sins and bring healing to our lives, bring healing to our families, bring healing to our marriage. Father, into your hands we commit our lives. And we know that our lives are in good hands with you, that you did not come to crush us, you did not come to punish us or to condemn us, but you came to rescue us, to save us, to love us, to shower us with love and mercy and compassion. God, who are we that you are so mindful of us? Who are we that you love us so much? Who are we that you have sent your son Jesus to take our sin, our guilt, our punishment, our shame on the cross? I don't know, Father, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful, Lord. And I pray that every day of my life I can express my gratitude by living out my life in obedience to you. 
Father, if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that this would be the day. Or perhaps they're looking for a church home. And Father, I pray that you'll impress it upon their hearts to join this church family and get plugged in here to serve you here and to worship you here. Father, we thank you in advance for how you're going to use this message. And Father, may we not just listen to this message we have heard here today and so deceive ourselves, but may we do what it says. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen.